I'm going to talk today uh, about some of the legal aspects of um, this uh, intriguing case, um, and in particular, this picking up the notion that uh, uh, has been spoken about uh, previously, uh, and that is that um, the Australian government has boasted that, uh, in fact, as recently as six weeks ago, Bob Carr was boasting that um, his department has intervened on 62 occasions to assist Mr. Assange and has done more than, uh, than he's done and his department has done for any other Australian over the same period of time. The problem with consular uh, assistance is it is of its nature fairly limited and passive. Um, it's essentially an advocacy and practical assistance service for Australians who find themselves in trouble overseas. So I want to talk today uh, about what lies beyond that particular form of assistance. Uh, last year, Natalie Klein, who's the Dean of uh, the School of Law at Macquarie University, uh, I think for the University of New South Wales, um, wrote a very interesting um, article in the um, Melbourne University Law Review uh, on what uh, she calls the customary international law right of diplomatic protection which is something that um, I don't think it certainly hasn't been used in this case by the Australian government. Diplomatic protection has um, a very fine lineage in the law. It was defined um, by the International Court of Justice in a case involving Belgium and Spain in 1970 as follows. Um, the court said that the state must be viewed as the sole judge to decide whether its protection will be granted, to what extent it is granted, and when it will cease. It retains in this respect a discretionary power, the exercise of which may be determined by considerations of a political or other nature unrelated to the particular case. So if we just unpack that for a moment, what the International Court of Justice was saying uh, in, um, in the Belgian and Spain case in 1970 is that every state has a discretionary power available to it and recognised in customary international law uh, to intervene to protect one of its own citizens uh, in a third country. Uh, but that that discretion can be, uh, the exercise of that discretion uh, can be limited or otherwise by political considerations and uh, economic and other considerations. Uh, the, um, in the Australian context, the doctrine of diplomatic protection uh, was put very succinctly uh, by Justice Finkelstein, who is now retired federal court judge and of course was the author of uh, a report into the media earlier this year, uh, in a case called Land Coon Chi and the Minister for Immigration, a 1998 case in the federal court. And he defined diplomatic protection this way. There is protection given to a national by his or her state in relation to other states. This is usually referred to as diplomatic protection. He then cites a well-known uh, author in this area, Dr. Weiss. Dr. Weiss describes diplomatic protection as a right of a state accorded to it by customary international law to intervene on behalf of its own nationals if their rights are violated by another state in order to obtain redress. He then goes on to say, this is Justice Finkelstein, thus, if a person has been injured in breach of international law, the state of nationality of that person has standing to intervene on behalf of its national. I'm just going to stop there. That's a very important point in the context of Assange. Uh, because the Australian government would argue in the case of Julian Assange that unlike David Hicks and Mundu Mbibi, he, in fact, has not been injured in the sense that uh, they have been injured, that is, that they have suffered uh, what I think is without doubt uh, torture on the, by, on the behalf of part of the Americans at uh, one time or another. However, the argument could well be, and I'll put it later, that uh, if uh, there, is, there are reasonable grounds to suspect that a person will be subjected to torture, then the Australian government has and, and can act uh, invoking the principle of diplomatic protection. But Justice Finkelstein um, goes on to say, diplomatic protection may be exercised by amicable or non-amicable means, 
It may be exercised informally, such as by negotiation or mediation, or more formally by international inquiry or arbitration or by litigation in courts, such as the International Court of Justice. Uh, and what His Honour was talking about there was the fact that it doesn't matter that the state um, against whom diplomatic protection is being asserted is hostile uh, to that assertion of diplomatic protection. Uh, that, uh, that doesn't mean that diplomatic protection, the doctrine of diplomatic protection doesn't apply. So the, the issue in this particular case, in the Assange case, is whether or not an Australian, uh, whether or not uh, Assange could bring a case in the Australian courts to compel the Australian government to take action to ensure that he's not subjected to torture in the United States, or perhaps more uh, directly at this point in time, or is not put in a position, potentially by the UK and Swedish governments, where his extradition to the United States and therefore torture is likely. The answer to that question is a complex one. Um, and it's been dealt with by the United Kingdom Court of Appeal in a case called Abbasi and the Secretary of State for Commonwealth, Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs in 2002. Abbasi was a, uh, a UK prisoner uh, at Guantanamo Bay. And uh, that court was led by Lord Phillips, who is of course now uh, the Chief Justice uh, of the United Kingdom Supreme Court, which is the equivalent to the Australian Court. So it's a very influential judgment. Uh, and the law lords in that case, um, uh, or the, the, the judges in that case, set out the following principles about how the doctrine of diplomatic protection might apply. The first thing they said, uh, and I'll put this in uh, non-legal language, uh, was to say that um, it's, it's not a defence by the um, Department of Foreign Affairs or the government to say uh, that uh, you can't, the courts can't review uh, our power to invoke the doctrine of diplomatic protection. Uh, because the real issue is what's the subject matter of the particular uh, case? Uh, they then go on to say, despite extensive citation of authority, there is nothing which supports the imposition of an enforceable duty to protect the citizen. The European Convention on Human Rights does not impose any such duty. Its incorporation into the municipal law cannot therefore found a sound basis on which to reconsider the, the authorities binding on this court. What, what's being said there is that there is no enforceable uh, duty on the part of a state. And as, uh, it, it is a duty which is purely discretionary. You cannot force a state to invoke uh, the doctrine of diplomatic protection. There is no right uh, that a citizen has. It is purely discretionary and it's not part of the domestic rule. But he then goes on to say, um, however, the Foreign Office, in that case, and here the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, has discretion whether to exercise the right, which un it undoubtedly has to protect British citizens. It has indicated in the ways explained what a British citizen may expect of it. The expectations are limited and the discretion is a very wide one, but there is no reason why its decision or inaction should not be reviewable if it can be shown that the same were irrational or contrary to legitimate expectation. But the court cannot enter the forbidden areas, including decisions affecting foreign policy. This is a very important uh, principle uh, because what's being said here is that if um, a government decides to, uh, at, a, at the request of a citizen or those representing a citizen, to invoke the doctrine of diplomatic protection and therefore to seek to protect a person against uh, torture or against uh, some other form of um, cruel and unusual punishment, uh, then its decision, if it rejects if it decides to reject uh, <coughs> diplomatic protection, uh, that is a reviewable decision in the courts. And that if, a, um, uh, if it can be shown that the decision was what we call in the law Wentz Brown reasonableness, which is a reference to a case, that is that 
It was so unreasonable that no reasonable decision maker could have made that decision. Uh, then uh, the decision may well be overturned. Uh, or if, uh, and this is the reference to legitimate expectation, which in Australia is more put on the basis of procedural fairness, if there is no fairness in assessing the application, that is, they receive the application, they don't uh, seek further information, they don't provide an opportunity uh, to be heard, uh, then again, uh, that decision is reviewable uh, and it can be uh, overturned. Um, the, court, uh, the Court of Appeal then, in the last two principles, uh, sets out uh, what is the extent of the obligation and when might it be exercised, and it is very similar to what the International Court of Justice said and what Justice Finkelstein said. Uh, that is, that um, the obligation to consider the position of a particular citizen and consider the extent to which some action might be taken on his behalf um, is something which is um, very much connected with a country's foreign policy and it's not something in which the courts will intervene. Um, and I think that it is important um, in this particular case, uh, as it was in uh, some of the other cases that come before the British and Australian courts, to recognise the limitations that the courts have. As the, you have the executive, you have the parliament, you have the courts, and the courts have always uh, shied away from interfering in matters of policy, seeing them as, uh, particularly foreign policy, seeing them as uh, being the prerogative of the parliament uh, and of the executive. So what can we say from uh, this uh, very brief summary of the doctrine of diplomatic protection? We can say, firstly, that the Australian government hasn't exercised it, despite the fact that it has an um, unquestioned uh, right to assert uh, the doctrine of diplomatic protection. We can say, secondly, uh, that if the doctrine were applied in the case of Julian Assange, then it is arguable that it can be extended to his case because there is a um, reasonable fear that uh, he will be uh, extradited to the United States and face torture. Uh, and thirdly, uh, that it is also arguable that if the Australian government, having been requested formally to invoke the doctrine of diplomatic protection, rejected that request, depending on the grounds of rejection, it can be reviewable in the Australian courts. Finally, um, the, the point must be this. Why is it that um, when it's not every day that uh, an Australian citizen uh, faces the prospect of torture and cruel and unusual punishment uh, overseas. Uh, we saw it, the inaction of the Australian Government in David Hicks' case for many years, Mamdou Habib, um, and we see it in Bali every day for Bali Nam. Uh, in Mr Assange's case, we have on record, uh, as recently as two weeks ago uh, in the Fairfax News, uh, claims that the Americans uh, saw him, uh, see him as an enemy of the state and that uh, the, therefore he would be subjected to the privations which come with being a maximum security prisoner. He would be placed in isolation, he would be subjected to interrogation techniques, um, all of which would amount to cruel and unusual punishment uh, and or torture. Given that that's the case, and so obviously the case, why is it that the Australian government uh, has not uh, invoked, as it should do, on behalf of the citizen? Because we are a signatory to relevant, relevant human rights conventions, and particularly we are a signatory to the convention and the optional protocol now in relation to cruel and unusual punishment and torture. Why is it that we are not seeking to assert through the doctrine of diplomatic protection, the uh, principles and the values which we purport to uphold. That's the question. And it's a question that needs to be asked of the Attorney General. It's a question that needs to be asked of the Foreign Minister. And I might say, it's a question that needs to be asked of the opposition, uh, the Liberal uh, National Party opposition parties.
It is extraordinary, I think, that the doctrine of diplomatic protection has not been uh, the source of greater focus uh, in this particular case. I don't say that with any sense of criticism of Julian's excellent legal team. Uh, they may have uh, made a request, uh, but it is certainly something to consider. It is certainly something to ask uh, of the Australian government whether or not uh, a request has been made for it uh, to exercise its, its rights under customary international law. Uh, and if it has done so, on what basis has it uh, been asked? And if it has rejected that, on what basis has it been rejected? Because the rejection, as I say, uh, may be a reviewable decision. As we saw in the case of Mr Habib, the use of the courts uh, can be uh, is significant. Uh, in his case, where the issues about diplomatic protection were in fact agitated before both the Federal Court and the full Court of the Federal Court, uh, the Commonwealth settled that, surprise, interesting. They didn't want it to go to trial. He had claims about uh, whether or not Australian security agencies knew or participated in uh, torture of him, I think, in Egypt. And the case was settled. Uh, but one of the live issues was what the Australian government, you, you know, whether or not Australian government officials, knowing that he was being tortured, uh, should have uh, invoked the doctrine of diplomatic protection. And if they didn't do that, whether they could hide behind some shield, uh, legal shield or another, to protect themselves. So um, that's a synopsis of a very interesting angle in this particular case, one which hasn't got a great deal of press to it. Uh, but which I think is certainly worth exploring and Scott Butler and his team have done a very good job on this case, uh, I think might want to add it to their uh, list of questions. Thank you.